Mr. Watson and gentlemen moderators and ladies and gentlemen of the audience, it is with profound gratitude to the God of heaven that we have come to this very hour when we can assemble together in the attitude of wanting to know what does the Bible say. Mr. Watson and myself, we both realize the responsibility that is ours to proclaim and preach the whole counsel of God. I want to say in the very beginning that I do not ask my opponent to show any quarter, for I assure you that none will be given. Truth is what I want, and if my proposition is not true, Mr. Watson will be the best friend I have in all the world, if he can point that out to me. I w want you to know that I trust that my heart is right, that if I believe that I am wrong at the end of this discussion, I trust that I will have the attitude that I would come up in public and let everyone know that I would apologize for preaching error, that I would make my determination to start preaching the truth from that day forward. I'm not mad at Mr. Watson. Frank and I have been good friends for several years. In fact, I have more respect for Frank Watson, with the exception of my good friend Harry Lewis. I have more respect for Mr. Watson than I do for any other preacher in the city of Evansville, because he has the courage and the conviction that would cause him to stand upon the polemic platform and discuss those truths that have to do with the soul. There are many other preachers in this city who believe exactly the same thing that Mr. Watson does, and yet they lack the courage and the intestinal fortitude that would give them the, the idea of defending the truth in public. We're here tonight to do as Jude commanded in Jude verse 3, to earnestly contend for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. We're here tonight to follow the example of the Apostle Paul in Philippians 1.17 when he said that he was set for the defense of the gospel. We're here tonight to do what the Apostle Peter said in 1 Peter 3 and verse 15, and that is to be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you concerning a reason of the hope that is in you. The wise man in the long ago in Proverbs 25 tells us very plainly to debate thy cause with thy neighbor. So we're here on good scriptural grounds to discuss the Bible, the Word of God. I believe one of the reasons that so many men have decided to no longer debate is they do not believe in the power of the written Word of God. In Romans chapter 1 and verse 16, the Apostle Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also unto the Greek. God, through the prophet Isaiah in the long ago, in Isaiah 55 and verse 11, said, My word will not return unto me void, but it will accomplish the purpose for which it is sent. And with those few remarks in mind, let us go on to our proposition this evening. The proposition reads simply as this, the scriptures teach that water baptism is for, in order to obtain, the remission of sins. According to the rules that we have assigned, Hedges Rules of Logic, it is my obligation to define the words of the proposition. By the word scriptures, I mean the 66 books of the Bible, 39 books of the Old Testament, 27 books of the New. This discussion is going to be centered upon the thought, what does the scripture teach? What does the Bible say? As a result of that, we're going to stay off the battlefields. We're going to stay away from the deserts, out of the hospital beds, away from hypothetical cases. We're not going to join in with our Pentecostal friends who toss the Bible aside and talk about the feeling in the heart. This discussion is centered on the idea the Scriptures teach. By the word teach, we mean that it imparts knowledge, that it gives information. As the Apostle Paul said in Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 4, thereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. The scriptures teach that water baptism, that baptism which was commanded by our Lord in Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 and following, when he said, All authority hath been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go you therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. The apostles were to baptize these people into the name of the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit. God has condescended to place upon baptism the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Any man that would ridicule baptism, any person that would mock it or minimize it, might as well take the name of God in vain, deny that Jesus is the Christ, and blaspheme the Holy Spirit. The Scriptures teach that water baptism is for, we put in parentheses, in order to obtain. By that we simply mean that it's not possible without it. The remission of sins, that is, the removal of sins of the past, Forgiveness, pardon, sanctification, and redemption. I want to address this evening the very first argument. The idea is that I believe the Bible teaches salvation by faith. The issue, the difference between Mr. Watson and myself is the, uh, not are we saved by faith. 
We both believe that a man is saved by faith. We agree with that. The question is, what type of faith? Is saving faith a great faith or a little faith? In your Bible, you can read of some individuals who had a living faith and others who had a dead faith. Is the faith that saves an obedient faith or disobedient faith? The question that we need to answer in this discussion is when is a man saved by faith? There are many scriptures that talk about salvation by faith, and I believe every one of them. Passages like John 3 and verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on him might not perish, but have everlasting life. But that's the starting point. That's not the end of the question. I will accept any passage that Mr. Watson might bring up that says we're saved by faith. Hallelujah. Amen. I believe we're saved by faith. But the question is, what type of faith is it? I believe that the Bible teaches us that faith is a conviction joined together with obedience. That's what we're looking for in the Bible. That's saving faith. A conviction of what a man believes that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, believing that He is the Messiah, conjoined with obedience. That is the idea of saving faith. Let me give you a few examples of this in your Bible. I hope that you have all brought your Bibles, and if you have, please turn with me into the book of Hebrews chapter 11. For I want to suggest that the faith that saves is the faith that obeys. Hebrews chapter 11. I gave the definition of faith, conviction, joined together with obedience. Here are some examples of men and women who had active and working faith. In verse 4 of this passage, by faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying to his gifts, and by it being dead yet speaketh. By faith, there is the conviction, joined together with obedience. By faith, Abel offered unto God. We go on down. By faith, Noah, in verse 7. By faith, Noah, being warned of God as things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his house. Here is the conviction, the faith, joined together with obedience. In verse 8, by faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he would afterwards receive as an inheritance, obeyed. And he went out not knowing whether he went. Here is the conviction, joined together with obedience. Verse 17 of this passage, By faith Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac, and he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son. By faith Abraham offered up. We go on down in this passage to verse 27, speaking of Moses, By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who was invisible. There was the conviction joined together with obedience. And verse 29, talking to the children of Israel, by faith they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land, which the Egyptians, the same to do so, were drowned. We all have the idea. Here was Moses leading the children of God. They got up to the border of the Red Sea and they said, we have faith. And they sat down on the ground and didn't do anything. No, they had the faith in God. There was their conviction joined together with obedience. By faith, they passed through the Red Sea as on dry ground. Certainly, my friend, the faith that could span the Red Sea ought to be able to span a baptistry. Go on down in this passage to verse 30. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they were compassed about for about seven days. We all remember the story back there in the book of Joshua chapter 6, how that by faith, the walls of Jericho fell down. Remember they all sat around the city of Jericho and crossed their arms and said, we have faith. Remember that story? Or you remember them getting up. They marched around the city. They blew the trumpet. As God said, there was the conviction joined together with obedience. Come it all down or sum it up in Romans chapter 16 and verse 26, where the Apostle Paul said that now was made manifest, and by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the everlasting God, made known to all nations for the obedience to the faith. That's the thing we're looking at. Now tell you what, my friend, you try faith only in any one of these passages and see what comes up. By faith only. Abel offered unto God. It won't work. By faith only. No one moved with it. No. Conviction joined together with obedience. By faith only, Moses forsook Egypt. By faith only, they passed through the Red Sea. Will not work in any one of the passages that we have here. What kind of faith are we talking about? This is it. Faith alone will not work in these passages. In the book of Acts, chapter 6, and verse 7, we find individuals where the Bible says that they were obedient to the faith. There were some people that when we look at faith, the Bible says that they were obedient to the faith. What a contrast that is between John 12 and verse 42, 43, 
Nevertheless, among the chief rulers, also many believed in him, but because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue, for they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. Here were two different faiths. Here was the faith in Acts 6 that was obedient. Here was the faith in John 12. The Bible plainly says they believed on him, and yet they would not confess him. Is that the faith that is going to save an individual? The question is, my friend, when does faith save? Open your Bibles with me into the book of Mark, chapter 16. Mark, chapter 16. Here, after the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, we have the Great Commission. These words constitute, in your Bible, among the final words of Jesus Christ. He tells his apostles in Mark, chapter 16, and verse 16, after telling them to go preach to, to everyone, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. As we look at this passage, I want to suggest unto you that baptism is the act which faith obeys. Conviction joined together with obedience. He that believeth, there is the faith, the, the conviction, joined together with obedience. The faith that saves is the faith that obeys. And notice this, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. The phrase, be saved or shall be saved, is the direct object of both verbs. Belief is dependent, or salvation is dependent upon two things, belief and baptism. I got a feeling. You just watch and see if it happens. Sometime during this week, this order is going to be changed. When you get down at the end of this week and you open your Bible, you see if Mark 16, 16 still says, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. The conditions in this passage are named. Conditions for salvation are named. Believe and be baptized. But you know, there are also conditions for damnation. Anyone want to know what to do to go to hell? It's in this passage. You don't believe at all. You know why? In John 3 and verse 18, Jesus said that the man that doth not believe is condemned already. God doesn't have to wait to see if he's going to disobey sometime down the road. The man that does not believe, he's condemned already. You want to know the conditions for salvation? They're found in this passage too. Believe and be baptized. And in this passage, we notice there's a little word, a little word and. Conjunction joins two words together. He that believeth and, and, and is baptized shall be saved. The little train you see on the board joined together by a coupler. A coupler joins two things together. That's what the word and does in your Bible. wonder if sometime during this week that coupler is going to be disconnected. As far as I can find in the study of those who teach in this area, there are only five views that men have on Mark 16, 16. Those who would teach infant baptism are friends in the Catholic Church. They look at Mark 16, 16, and they say, He that believeth not and is baptized shall be saved. You ever see him take one of those little babies, kicking and squirming, put a little water on him, call that baptism? Baby doesn't believe, but go through the act, and that's going to bring salvation. Then we have our friends who might be atheists. They say, He that believeth and is baptized shall not be saved. They don't believe in God at all. Then we might have our friends who are universalists. They believe everyone's going to heaven. And they look at Mark 16, 16, and in their mind they're thinking, he that believeth not and is not baptized shall be saved. They think everyone's going to heaven, regardless of whether you believe, regardless of whether you repent, regardless of whether you love or confess or pray or are baptized. They think everyone's going to heaven. Then we got our friends in the Baptist church. And they look at Mark 16, 16. Although they read it a little bit differently than the way you read it this evening. They look at Mark 16, 16, and they say, he that believeth, and is not baptized shall be saved. Not the way your Bible reads. The Bible that you have in your hand, the way it reads tonight, the same way it's going to read Friday night, the view that I believe, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. And though some people might shake their fist in the face of God and say, I don't have to be baptized, until they say, if I do what this passage says, it will violate grace, the passage still says, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. In our rules that we've made for this discussion, we have agreed that both of us can ask the other three questions that have to be answered in the first beat. One of the questions I've asked for Mr. Watson, and which he'll be answering in just a few moments, what does Mr. Watson believe regarding Mark 16, 16? Does he believe he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, or he that believeth and is not baptized shall be saved? It's an either-or proposition. I want him to come up here, and he signed his name to the fact he's going to get up here this tonight, in the next 30 minutes, 
Tell us which one of these two does he believe? Say what I believe. Believe it's exactly the way it's written in your Bible. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Think of a parallel. He that believeth and entereth the ark shall be saved. You think that entering the ark is necessary to being saved? I say, yes, it does. The Lord said, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Turn your Bibles with me to the book of Hebrews, chapter 5. Hebrews, chapter 5. Talked about faith, conviction, joined together with obedience. In Hebrews 5, speaking about Christ, the Bible says, Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered, and being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation to all them that obey him. While our Lord was upon this earth, he gave us his last will and testament. The terms were announced in the book of Acts, chapter 2, and verse 38, the passage we read a few moments ago. Peter, uh, Peter announced it in Acts 2, 38, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And we go back to this passage, and we try to tie these two things together. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. We're going to come and look at this passage more in detail in just a moment. But keep your Bible open here to Hebrews 5 for just a moment. He's the author of eternal salvation. To all them that obey him. There is a command in your Bible to believe. Everyone accepts it. Everyone understands it. Is Christ the author of eternal salvation to all them that will not believe? There is a command in your Bible to be baptized. Mark 16, 16. Acts 2, 38, which we'll read in a moment. Is Christ the author of eternal salvation to those who will not obey? The answer is no. You know, the universalist will look at Hebrews 5, 8, and 9, and he'll say that Christ is the author of eternal salvation to those who will not believe. It's not what the Bible says. Our Baptist friends come along and say that Christ is the author of salvation to those who are not baptized. The Bible says that he's the author of eternal salvation to all them that obey him. Conviction joined together with obedience. The inevitable conclusion is that the man who does not have enough faith to be baptized does not have enough faith to be saved. Here in this passage, in Acts chapter 2, the apostle Peter, on the day of Pentecost, stood up with the other 11 apostles and preached the very first gospel sermon this side of Calvary. The terms of the last will and testament of Christ are found in this passage. There is an inseparable connection in this passage between the words baptism and remission of sins. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sin. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This passage makes remission of sins depend on baptism just as much as it depends upon repentance. And in the same sense. Now there are two things mentioned in this passage. Repent and... Wait a minute, Rob, we get on down to there. Repent and be baptized. There's a little word for in this passage. Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Talking to a, a friend of mine, a Baptist preacher here in town last week, he said, you know, your whole discussion is going to center around that little word for. He said, don't you know that that word for means because of? And I asked the question, whatever repentance is for, baptism is for in this passage. Now, when were these people forgiven? Were these people forgiven when Peter began preaching? Were they forgiven when they were pricked in the heart, as we read a few verses before? Were they forgiven when... When they uh, ask the question, what should we do? The answer is no. They were forgiven when they obeyed the command to repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. What was the object of the question that they asked in this passage? They asked the question, what should we do? The, question, the object of the question, what should these believers do in order to be saved? What were these people saved? Mr. Watson, were these people saved when they were pricked in the heart? Were these people saved when they asked, what shall we do? Or were they saved when they obeyed the command of Peter to repent and be baptized? Put the boxcar illustration on again, Rob. In this passage, we have two words again. Repent and be baptized. Again, joined together with a little couple, a little word and. Now, I've got a feeling we might find out tonight what Mr. Watson believes about this passage. Does he believe that a man is going to repent and be baptized because he's already saved? in order to obtain the remission of sin. Whatever repentance is for in Acts 2.38, 
Baptism is for. Which direction is this train going? Is this train saying, repent and be baptized because you have already been forgiven? Or does a passage say, repent and be baptized in order to obtain the remission of sins? In the book of Matthew, chapter 19 and verse 6, Jesus, as he was talking about marriage, made the simple statement, what God has joined together, let not man put asunder. And while he was speaking of marriage in that passage, you know it's true of everything God has ever done. When God has joined it together, let man keep his hands off of it. Now in this passage, God has joined repentance and baptism together for one end, for one purpose, the remission of sins. When were these people saved? Now in his next speech, or in his first speech up here, Mr. Walker is going to get up and tell us when the people in Acts 2 were saved from their sins. If you have your Bible, please turn with me to another passage. In the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 11, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, the Apostle Paul was speaking, and he said, For it hath been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. Now this I say, that every one of you say, I am a Paul, and I am a Paul, and I am Cephas, and I am Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? According to this passage, something was necessary for a man to be considered a Paul. Now the word of Paul or of Apollos, I am a, means I belong to. Apparently, some of the people in Corinth were walking around, I belong to Paul. Someone else was saying, I belong to a Paul. Another, I belong to Cephas. And another, I belong to Christ. I want to ask you the question. Is Christ divided? Was it right for these people to do it? Obviously not. It was wrong for them to take upon themselves the name of some man. Paul said, is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? Mr. Watson, in verse 13, there are two things that are mentioned in order for a man to be a Paul. And if a man was going to say that I am a Paul, two things would have to be necessary. We've asked Mr. Watson to tell us what these two things were. For a man to be a Paul, two things mentioned. Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? We want him to get up here and talk about this passage for just a few minutes. In your Bible, God has been very specific in his choice of words. In your Bible, as far as I can find, there are only five passages in all the New Testament that mention the words baptism and salvation in the very same verse, only five. Now, I know there are a lot of verses that talk about salvation and leave baptism out, talk about salvation with love and hope and repentance and all this but there are only five passages in the Bible that have the words baptism and salvation in the very same verse. One look at these passages with me. In the book of Mark, chapter 16, and verse 16, Jesus said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Which comes first in this passage? Salvation or baptism? He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. They come on down to the book of Acts, chapter 2, and verse 38. And Peter tells these people, when they ask, what shall we do? He says, repent, and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. In this passage, which comes first? Baptism or the remission of sins? They go on to the conversion of Saul in Acts 22, 16. Remember Ananias after the Lord had appeared unto Saul? Ananias went in. And in Acts 22, 16, the question was asked, uh, Saul, why carriest thou? Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins. I would consider, I believe Mr. Watson, with the idea that having our sins washed away is equivalent to salvation. But which came first? Arise, be baptized, and wash away thy sins. We come on up in our Bible, to the book of Romans, chapter 6, and verse 4. And here the Apostle Paul is speaking. He said, Therefore we are buried with him in baptism into death. The like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. In this passage, which came first, baptism or the newness of life? Now I know John 3.16 says, Whosoever believeth on him might not perish, but have everlasting life. I said I believe that passage. We're talking about baptism tonight. And in the passages that deal with baptism, which comes first? 
baptism and salvation. Come on down to 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 21. The like figure were unto even baptism. Doth also now save us, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer, the assurance, the good conscience towards God. In this passage, which comes first? Baptism. The Bible says baptism, doth also now save us. Mr. Watson, will you please get up here and explain to us how these orders go. I want you that are listening out there to see if Mr. Watson answers the questions. We ask about Mark 16, 16. Which does he believe? He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Or he that believeth and is not baptized shall be saved. We ask about the people in Acts 2. When were they saved? Were they saved when, they, when he started preaching? Were they saved when they asked what shall we do? Or were they saved when they obeyed the command of Acts 2.38? We ask about Paul, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. What was the order there? I pray that you'll give attention to Mr. Watson. May God give grace to the right.